Tonight, we will examine close encounters of the fourth kind. The witnesses have not only had personal contact with extraterrestrial life forms, but were also detained by them. The recreations of aliens and their spacecraft are based upon a composite of testimonies and research. Interviews from around the world have described two basic kinds of aliens, the small greys with large eyes and heads, and the Nordic types, blonde, tall, muscular, humanoids. The reenactments you are about to see were experienced by people whose lives had been altered forever. Travis Walton, a man who is about to take a unique and terrifying journey. A journey to the other side of his belief system. All of his notions of reality will be called into question. But right now, what Travis has on his mind is very much of this world. His best friend, Mike Rogers' young sister, has stolen his heart. I'm gonna ask her. I'm gonna ask who? Dana. Ask her what? Yes. Let's go up this hill. To marry me. Great. It makes my day. Mike. What's your problem? She's too young. You got your whole life to get married. No rushing. I love her. Yeah, that just solves everything, doesn't it, Travis? At first, it seemed just like any other night as they headed home from work. What's that? I don't know. Maybe it's forest fire. I don't see any smoke. Yeah, well, what the hell is it? Get closer to it, Mike. Get closer to it. What we saw was not that far away. I mean, we could we could see this thing. It was clear, it was distinct. It wasn't uh, uh, just a point of light in the sky or anything like this. This was very close. You could have thrown a rock and hit it. I was scared, but uh, like everyone there, but I got out and went towards it. Uh, it might have been a foolish thing, but uh, I was thinking this thing might uh, take off, you know? It just, I just wanted to get a closer look. I figured this would vanish. Travis, get back in here! After we'd put maybe a quarter of a mile distance between us and it, I suddenly realized what we had done. And I uh, realized that our friend was back there, that I'd left him there. So I stopped the truck, and several of them 
didn't want that at all. And I says, well, we have to. We have to go back. He could be, he could be hurt. Obviously, is hurt, and we can help him. We went back to the site. The thing was gone. Travis was gone. So uh, we thought maybe uh, he wandered off somewhere. So we conducted a hand-in-hand -hand search, you might say, uh, six grown men walking around in the woods, about as close to each other as they could get. We decided that uh, without being able to find him, we would have to uh, do something. What would we do? We, all we could think of was go to the authorities. The sheriff arrived and listened to their story. He was cautious, but not completely disbelieving. He decided that the only thing to do was to go back up the hill in the morning and look for Travis. Three of the guys had no intention of going back up the hill. They wanted to stay right down there where they were. And uh, so me and one other fella and several of the sheriff people went back up the hill and covered all the roads below and above. And uh, we looked for tracks, we looked for sign, we listened. We couldn't uh, find him at all. There was no trace of him at all, no tracks of any kind anywhere. It just seemed that, that they must have taken him. Whoever they were, we had no idea at that point. It's only maybe 100 feet or so away from us. I'm just sitting there to fill this whole area in here. See how it's all burned up and stuff? It was huge, you know? It was filled this whole thing up. And just it's the weirdest damn thing I've ever seen. Somebody from somewhere other than this world had taken him, and he was just not there. Mike Rogers and the sheriff went to inform Travis Walton's mother that her son was missing. I'm sorry. I left him. I didn't know what to do. I'm sorry. All through that night and the, the next several days, it was incomprehensible. We, we could not understand what had happened. It just didn't sink in. Something had happened, something odd had happened. We didn't know if it was terrible, whether it was great, we didn't know, but it's something that we couldn't understand had happened, and it was, it was very uh, traumatic, very traumatic, the most traumatic event that I have ever encountered. The sheriff from Holbrook suspected that the men had murdered Travis and buried his body in the woods, and that they were using the UFO story as an alibi. He wanted some answers and wasn't going to give up until he got them. Well, Dallas, why don't you tell us about this conversation with Travis? Joe, they was just talking about his sister. Now, they've been dating. Did you have a problem with Travis here, son? Travis was my best friend. Why would I kill him? No, I don't know. I understand he wanted to marry your sister. Well, maybe you didn't like that idea. Oh, man. <laughs> if you boys are all telling the truth, why not take a lie detector test? It's fine with me. Hell yeah, I'll do it. Well, good. We'll get to the bottom of this yet. Visitors from the unknown will continue. The examiner gave an official report. Her name, Mike Rogers. They told Mike Rogers it was the first time the polygraph examiner had such a large number of subjects to work with regarding the same event and actually used the word proof in his report. He said his findings positively proved the men did see something that they believed was a UFO. No. Did you see spacecraft? Yes, I did. Later, Travis returned with a remarkable story. When I felt the numbing shock, I blacked out. And the next thing I knew, I regained consciousness. Uh, not quickly, sort of uh, gradually. Uh, my head wasn't real clear. I was in, in a lot of pain. I was laying on my back. I didn't know where I was. Um, I, I remembered what had happened in the woods as I was regaining consciousness, I was trying to figure out what I was and what was going on. I thought maybe I was in a, in a hospital or something, that I'd been hurt. When I 
was standing in front of those things that were coming towards me, and they stopped there and they stood there looking at me. These huge eyes just seemed to just look right through me. I, I didn't get any impression of emotion. It was a very uh, detached sort of just observing sort of thing, but it seemed like they could see everything I was thinking and feeling. Very disturbing feeling to feel so exposed. They, these huge eyes looked at me and they, when they, they'd blink and on an eye that big, the eyelid just slid down and opened like a, like a window opening and shutting and it was, it just had the strangest sort of feeling. I just couldn't, I couldn't bear the, their gaze. was a lever there, and when I moved that, the star pattern appeared to move. That kind of disoriented me for a minute because, you know, it felt like I was moving kind of for a second because this was, you know, to have everything suddenly shift like that. But um, I figured I'd better quit messing with that. I, I, you know, I had by that time surmised that I was in some sort of craft and connected it to what had happened before. and. I figured I might crash this thing or something. This person was not like these humanoid creatures that I'd seen earlier. This looked like a human being, looked like a man in a blue uniform. I went up to him thinking, you know, that I was being rescued, that I was being saved, uh, that this was a person, you know. I, started asking all kinds of questions. Where am I? I mean, where are we? I mean, who were those things that I saw? Talk to me. There was an inrush of air, and it felt like fresher and cooler than where I'd been. It must have been like the, the air I was in was real heavy, and moist, and stifling. Just pulled me quickly on, uh, went through some doors, down a hallway, to another room. What are you guys doing? What's going on here? I mean, who are you people? Touch me. Don't touch me! Don't get your hands off me! What are you doing? Don't touch me! What are you doing? Five days had passed before Travis returned. He was asked to take a lie detector test. He too passed. Little did he know that this event would cast a shadow over the rest of his life. Many believe he is a man of courage, while others accuse him of being a liar. The thing that has brought more frustration and, and pain into my life as a result of all this happening is the fact that 
people can't see me anymore, me as a person. I get a feeling of invisibility because of this thing. Every contact I have with people is covered by, is filtered through the distorting lens of something that just happened to me 15 years ago. And, and it is something that just happened to me. Uh, I didn't do anything special or heroic. Um, I, I'm, not, I'm not a hero or a celebrity anymore than I'm a uh, de deceiving rascal or, or a, a crackpot space cadet sort of person. Um, I, I would like to be seen as myself rather than in terms of this thing that just happened to me. It could have happened to anyone. All of the woodsmen moved away except Mike and Travis. They are still friends. Travis married Mike's sister, Dana, and they have four beautiful children and still live in the same small town in Arizona but no one has forgotten what happened more than 15 years ago. Visitors from the unknown will come. And this is my story, and it is real. Meet Alan Godfrey, a British police officer in the West Yorkshire Metropolitan Police Force. Alan, born and raised in this working-class neighborhood near the Moors, is married and the father of two children. He has been commended twice for his investigative work in cases of sudden and mysterious deaths. Alan is proud to be a policeman and proud of his accomplishments. His story began 14 years ago, when Alan was looking for three men suspected of brutally assaulting someone the night before. Headquarters, this is PC Godfrey. I've located the three suspects outside a pub. Uh, it's called the Carpenter Arm. I'm going to take them into custody, send back up. I was kicked in the groin area, uh, as a result of which later on I did lose a, a testicle. The police surgeon explained that Alan would require a long period of recuperation. You're going to need a lot of rest. He was both physically and psychologically devastated and was told he would no longer be able to have a normal sex life. I was also told I would never, I'm definitely been sterile for the rest of my life. I would not be able to uh, father children again. Alan finally returned to active duty. Three years later, he was called to the scene of a mysterious death. Looks like we got a murder on our hands. What was strange about the guy was he was wearing a top coat, but he wasn't wearing a shirt. He was wearing a, a, a string vest, you know? His jacket had been fastened unevenly at the top here. His trousers and the fly was undone on the trousers. Uh, his shoes appeared at that. He hadn't put them on himself. They, they hadn't been tied properly. At 10 a.m., the body was not there according to the owner of the coal yard. An off-duty officer had been present at 1.30 p.m. and found nothing unusual. Later that afternoon, the body was discovered and subsequent tests proved he had been dead for at least eight hours. So the question remained, where had he died? And 
How did he get to the top of the coal pile? This guy died of shock. Mm -hmm. Where the hell are these burn marks from? There was a strange substance on the back of the dead man's neck, which the forensic pathologist proceeded to analyze. The guy, although he died of a heart attack, the heart attack had been brought on by something that really, really terrified him. The victim was identified as Zygmunt Adamski. The coroner wanted the police to ascertain why this guy had turned up some 30 or 40 miles from his home, where he'd been for six days, where the burn marks had come from. More importantly, what was the substance that had been applied to the guy's wound at the back of the neck? because the substance could not be identified as anything known on Earth. The police were further baffled. There were no footprints leading to where the body was found. This is really important to, to remember this. The fact that the guy climbed a, a stack of coal, well, supposedly climbed a stack of coal, if he had got there under normal power, and was suffering from a heart condition in, in inclement weather as it was, uh, and to lie there on the top and just look up the sky and die is, is ridiculous. With the Adamski death still nagging at him, Alan encountered something even more extraordinary. I was on patrol in my police car, and we'd been getting strange, uh, unusual calls from members of the public about a herd of cows that were kept appearing and disappearing on a local council estate. Uh, we, we, we went up there and had a look, and the, there was nothing. You know, there was no trace of these cows. There was no sign of them. They, you know, cows leave trademarks. We all know this. So it was rather unusual that these cows couldn't be found. Headquarters, this is PC Alan Godfrey. I'm going up to council estate to check on the cows. Over. As I was approaching the council estate, I was going to come off the main road when I saw in front of me uh, a large object that was blocking the road up ahead. I put my, my warning flashing lights on, the blue flashing lights on. My first reaction was that it was a, a double-decker bus that had gone skidded sideways, or whatever, it, it, there was something blocking the road. Uh, so I instinctively drove towards it. As I was approaching the object, it, it was a sight that really I wasn't expecting to see, you know? I mean, there was a, an object that was hovering. It wasn't actually on the ground. It was actually hovering over the ground, about five feet. This in itself, you know, is a bit strange, to say the least. Hello, in headquarters, this is PC Alan Godfrey. I need a I tried the car Hello? radio, it wouldn't Hello. work. My personal radio. Nobody would answer me on the radio. It was completely dead. I've got it hovering in front of me about 25 yards is an object that really one only expects to see in such films as uh, third encounters of a close encounters of a third kind. Uh, E.T. and things like this. I mean, this was totally unbelievable. It just didn't register with any of the training I've been given as a police officer. It became obvious to me that what I was looking at was a UFO. There was no emittance of noise from it, and there was certainly no heat coming from it. The trees that was lining the road were shaking violently, so whatever it was, was there was a force coming from it. Although at that time, while I was sat in the police car, I couldn't feel any vibration in the police car. But there was no way I was going to get out. I wasn't going to get out of the police car. I felt very secure in there. And then a very 
strange thing occurred. Suddenly, there was a, a jump in time. After I'd done the drawing, or the, my last conscious memory was of doing the drawing, I suddenly found myself another 20 or 30 yards up the road, driving the police car, and the object had gone. Alan realized that 20 minutes had passed, and he could not remember what had happened. He turned the car around and went back to where he had seen the UFO. I was a bit gobsmacked at this. It had been raining all night, so the road surface should really have been absolutely wet through. But where this object had been, the road surface was whirlpool dry. Visitors from me. So, where are the little green men, Alan? Oh, oh, that's funny. Yeah. How come it's totally dry here and everything else is wet? Maybe Alan's really seen something. So we went into the adjoining park. And the only way you can get into the park is over the bridge and through a, a locked gate. Which is obviously it's open during the day, but during the hours of darkness, the gate's locked. So no thing can get into the park. Uh, we got in. We, we unlocked the gate because we have the keys to get into the park for obvious reasons. What they discovered was a herd of cows that had mysteriously appeared in the center of the field. These were the missing cows that Alan had been looking for. This is the herd of cows I've been looking for all night. We, you know, we've been running around. And here they are. Oh. How'd these cows get in here? There's no trail. Now, this is rather strange, and this is starts blowing your mind here, because I'd just seen something that I... a UFO, that... I found absolutely totally unbelievable. And I wasn't expecting to see something like that. And uh, another strange occurrence, the cows, you know. How did the cows get there? The only way they could have got there is somebody had gone plonk and dropped them there. Although Allen's fellow officers did not take the incident seriously, an inspector reminded him that it was official procedure to report the incident to the divisional headquarters in Halifax. The object was reported by three other police officers 12 miles from here and two more in Lancashire County. The teasing stopped. For the next 12 months, everything went back to normal. Then, an investigative reporter realized that the PC Alan Godfrey of the Adamski case was the PC Alan Godfrey of the UFO case. The reporter suggested Adamski was the victim of a UFO abduction. The story hit the front page of a national newspaper with Alan as the link between the two mysterious incidents. The spotlight was on Alan, and he and his family and superior officers were not at all happy about it. Crikey. Whenever Alan testified in court, his credibility was ridiculed because of his UFO report. His superiors attempted to humiliate him. They wanted him to resign from the force. They even took his police car from him and replaced it with a bicycle. Meanwhile, a friend who had also experienced a UFO sighting convinced Alan to undergo hypnotic regression. The hope was to discover what had occurred during the missing 20 minutes. This regression helped him
tried to wake you up and couldn't. What night, love? That night I heard that same sound over our bed. I tried to wake Alan up, but he was in such a deep sleep I couldn't wake him. Finally, the noise went away. The next morning, Alan and I made love for the first time since he was beaten up. And then I became pregnant. Well, all I want to know is how did my wife get pregnant if I'm unable to father children? I mean, maybe she's been fooling around, huh? I don't know how it happened, Alan. But your condition has completely been reversed. This test shows you're fertile. Back to normal. While many questions were raised, few were answered. The Adamski death remains unsolved. Alan Godfrey is still unable to consciously remember the missing 20 minutes. Although Alan no longer serves in the police force he was so proud of, the thought persists that the visitors did serve some positive function in his life. He is extremely grateful to have recovered, and especially to have had another child. My name is John R. Salter, Jr. This is my story, and it's real. John Salter, Jr. is the head of Indian studies at the University of North Dakota and holds a master's degree in sociology. The son of a Native American and a second generation Scot, he was a human rights activist who fought for civil rights throughout the Deep South. He was also director of Catholic social justice activities for the Rochester, New York Diocese. He has been honored with numerous awards, among them the Martin Luther King Jr. Award, presented by the governor of North Dakota. But all of his knowledge and experience could not explain what was about to happen to him this day. John Salter and his son left their home in North Dakota for a speaking tour in the Deep South. My then 23-year-old son and I took off, pointed toward Mississippi and New Orleans. Uh, since, I'm, since I've been about 13, I've traveled with my father all over the country. And one of the things we've always done is pick the straightest shot, you know, from point A to Z. However, on this trip, John Salter, for reasons he could not explain, took a route which was completely illogical. Intending to stay on Route 61, John Salter turned off the main highway onto a less traveled road, heading in the wrong direction. At around that very point, both my son and I were hit gently by double amnesia. For the next more than 60 miles, we remembered nothing. At about 10 minutes of eight, almost an hour and a half later, we emerged from the double amnesia. It was dark. I was going down a hill. I can recall very clearly the lights of the pickup on the highway, the sound of the engine and the tires, 
flowing into my broadening, expanding consciousness. Check the map. We're turned around heading towards Madison. But that's impossible. How did we get here? I don't know. Been off course for over an hour. I can't remember anything. Neither can I. That evening, uh, you know, when we stopped in Bettendorf and we went to that restaurant, there were several police officers, several uh, uh, men wearing hats with FBI labels on them, uh, like they'd been part of some kind of search team or something. And I remember feeling incredibly guilty, as if we were a couple of bank robbers or outlaws. And we hadn't done anything wrong, of course. You know, we don't even go over 55. What's happening to us? I don't know. How could we both not remember anything for over an hour? Dad, why are we whispering? Why do we feel like we did something wrong? If this were the Navajo country, I'd believe this to be witchcraft. We drove down the highway, and we were listening to music and uh, kind of talking quietly. And then we saw the light coming towards us. It was glittering, it was shining, it came towards us. Uh, it, was, it was unusual, it was fast, and it had my complete attention. I couldn't look at anything else. It was enveloped in a kind of energy field which added up to the most exquisite shimmering silvery thing that I've ever seen in my life. Dad, that was a UFO, wasn't it? What else could it have been? Remember Betty and Barney Hill? No. Well, they were a real responsible couple. They were picked up by a UFO and didn't even know it. Do you think we were picked up? I don't know, son. To the Salters, this extraordinary sighting somehow seemed connected to the missing time and odd feelings of the previous night. I also saw this as a very friendly kind of an appearance, a sort of a adios or a hostile luego. But the Salters were still mystified. The real significance of what happened was about to unfold. something really strange has happened to us. I feel that way, too. I know this sounds weird, but I wish they'd come visit us again. As they continued their journey, the soldiers searched their memories for explanations. What really occurred during that missing time? Why did the UFO appearance feel so familiar to them? And why did they have such feelings of longing for something they could not identify? In a series of recall flashbacks, the lost time slowly came into focus. thinking to myself, they look like children up on the bumper looking in. They look just like little kids.
Standing in the shadows was another humanoid. This man is as tall as I am, six feet. He is half human, half humanoid, a half-breed, so to speak. I felt a very close bond immediately with this tall figure that stepped from the shadows. And at one point, I stumbled and fell and was cushioned and prevented from hitting the ground by what I'm convinced is some sort of telekinetic psychic force generated by the humanoids. Atmosphere was rather Spartan in nature. I remember the feeling of laying in a chair, and it was like being in a dentist's office because I was aware of what was happening, but I couldn't move. Uh, I couldn't move my face, I couldn't move my body. Uh, I wasn't strapped down, but I was immobilized in some way. One of the things done initially to me after a cursory medical exam was placing of a very small implant up my right nostril and beyond. This was a painless procedure. And we believe that it, it affects the pituitary gland, one of the endocrine glands. Immediately after that, an injection was made in the vicinity of the thyroid gland, another endocrine gland. And following that, there was a massive injection into the upper central chest, the thymus gland. There would be like a zipping, zipping sensation, um, like almost like tiny electrical shocks. I've talked to people who've had tattoos and they've described that uh, as being similar. My feeling was one of great friendliness, very much at ease. Everyone, all through this experience, was very pleasant. In the months that followed, John Salter began to notice changes to his body. His fingernails, which he'd normally clipped every three weeks, had to be clipped once a week. His hair began growing more rapidly. His sparse eyebrows began to thicken, and his facial wrinkles began to disappear. I now had developed a very strong need for protein, meat, and fish. At the same time, an odd craving for things like green peas. A 25-year-old scar suddenly faded. Salter had very little body hair, but now found it growing all over his body. Before the UFO encounter, Salter smoked a pound of pipe tobacco a week. I smoked like an Arizona smelter. But in the middle of May, 1989, I stood in my office and realized that I had gone 24 hours without smoking anything. And I stopped smoking and have remained a non-smoker without suffering a single physical or psychological twinge. No twinges of any kind. I recall that we walked through the woods, downhill, back to the pickup, and I felt an extraordinary sense of sadness at the fact that we were parting. There is no way that I can adequately describe the intense sadness that I felt. And then the message came that we will all see one another again in another place, in another time.
These have been but three of hundreds of reported UFO encounters. While no scientific proof is available to the public, one thing remains clear. A growing number of people believe extraterrestrial life exists, and still others believe Earth is being visited regularly. If so, where are they from? What do they want? These questions remain unanswered. <laughs>